Good evening. We're here tonight to talk about Kay Boyle, a resident of Marin County who was last year inducted posthumously into the Marin Women's Hall of Fame. I'm Beth Ashley. I'm a reporter for the Independent Journal. I met Kay Boyle. I interviewed her, and I became a friend of hers in the last years of her life. And yet I feel that I knew only superficially about her uh, all those things that everyone else knows about Kay Boyle, that she was a prolific writer of poetry, short stories, and novels, that she was a member of the so-called lost generation of expatriates in Paris, that she was a, uh, an, a fierce believer in um, causes of civil rights and um, anti-war activism, and she was uh, an extraordinary woman who led an extraordinary life. We're very fortunate tonight to have with us Ian Frankenstein, her son, who is going to be able to tell us a little bit more about what kind of woman she was, what kind of writer she was, what kind of mother she was, what kind of person she was that we all want to remember. Um, Please welcome Ian, and Ian, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Kay's early life. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, well, Kay was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and her great, greatest influence was her mother. And uh, I can almost say, say the same thing. It's like those Reader's Digests magazines that say the most influential person in your life. Uh -huh. For Kay, it was her mother. And certainly for me, it was Kay. And uh, Kay learned to uh, write and read at a very early age because of her mother. Kay was terrified of going to school and uh, actually was over, always very proud of the fact that she left school at the age of seven or eight My. and never to return. And I remember so many times later on in her life, and, and certainly uh, in her twilight years, people found it hard to believe that she had written so many books, that she had accomplished so much, that she had degrees, honorary degrees, and people would say, well, certainly you went to college. And she said, no, the, uh, the eighth grade was it. Um, school was very traumatic for her. But her mother filled in that, that gap for her and read to her from Gertrude Stein and people like that. And uh, they traveled, when she was a child, to Europe several times on steamships, which was the way you went. And uh, her mother was her, her mentor and the, the one figure um, who exposed her to the incredible world that she was later to embrace. I understand that Kay always knew she was going to be a writer? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. She, it, never without a doubt. I think that's true about most people who are, who are destined to be something. Mm -hmm. It's something they manifest at a very early age, mm -hmm. and it certainly was true with Kay. She and her older sister, Joan, would, uh, they had a newspaper. They lived in Cincinnati, and they had a, a newspaper that they sort of published. And uh, the other great figure in Kay's life was her grandfather, whom they affectionately called Grandpa or Grandfather Puss. And he was a very um, domineering, but um, I guess in today's standards, he would be sort of macho because he was very, oh, uh, patriarch and, patriarchal and so forth and uh, had little patience for women suffragists and for uh, children's crusades and things like that. But um, nevertheless, he uh, was a great supporter of, of, or I should say a nurturer of, of his granddaughters, both Kay and Joan's efforts in writing and in this little newspaper that they published and these little articles that they wrote. That's fun. I understand that uh, Kay, uh, maybe her first brush with uh, real writers, uh, aside from those in books, was when she moved to New York at the age of 19. Can you tell us what she Actually, did there? Actually, it was more like 18, but... Okay. Well, she, I think she wa really wanted to get away from, from her grandfather and her father, 
uh, because she felt that they really stunted her growth as, as an artist and as a woman. And of course, it was a time, what, this was 1920, 1921. Mm -hmm. It was a time, certainly, when women uh, uh, weren't supposed to do the things that we now take for granted uh, that women do uh, in society today. And so she went to New York, and one of the reasons she went to New York was because her, her sister Joan was already in New York work, working for a fashion magazine, and Kay wanted to strike out on her own. And she um, uh, finally, after getting in contact with several magazines and getting rejections and so on, she worked with Lola Ridge for Broom Magazine, which was the top uh, 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 glossy uh, Vogue magazine, in Vogue magazine in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was that time that she became aware of writers like uh, William Carlos Williams and, um, and uh, began getting some of her poems published in New York City, mm -hmm. but it was still very much a struggle for her. Mm -hmm. yeah. She um, didn't stay in New York too long. Where did she go from there? She didn't stay in New York too long because she was in love with and, um, and married a French soldier who was uh, a student in Cincinnati and uh, joined her after he graduated from, well, I'm not sure what university <laughs> it was, in Cincinnati. He joined her in New York and they lived together in New York City and uh, subsequently got married. Um, on June 24th, 1922, I believe. <laughs> oh, God, I and, remember. Uh, yeah, I was there. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, they lived together, and he had to uh, get a job with the, uh, much to his, oh, un it was unpleasant for him, he had to get a job with the, with the utility company, so like Con Edison at the time in, in New York City, even though he had this degree in, 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 uh, from, from university. And, um, and I think one of the reasons was that his, his inability to really speak English very well, he pronounced, for heaven's sake, for heaven's sock. <laughs> and things, so when he went to knock on houses to, to <clears throat> check the meters and do things like that, um, it never went over very well with the, with the customers that he was serving. So it kind of kept him limited in his scope. And he, of course, wanted to return to France. And their idea was to live in the northern, northern part of France, not live with his family, live separately. She would write in an idyllic pastoral situation, and he would figure out what he was going to do with his life. But it didn't turn out that way because they went and they moved to La Havre, and they lived with... This His family. This family. Mm -hmm. And how did they get to Paris, or how did Kay get to Paris? Well, it was some time later, really, that she got to Paris. She was aware of the Renaissance that was happening in Paris, but it was because she contacted TB, and in those days, you went to the mountains or the seashore for a cure. And she had been writing to a young Irish poet named, Irish-American poet named Ernest Walsh, who oh. lived in the south of France, who lived in a town near Nice called Grasse, where I went to this past summer, because I was retracing much of where Kay lived, uh, not only Paris, but Nice and Grasse. And uh, they were corresponding, and um, they sort of developed um, almost a, a love affair, really, through their letters. And uh, so he said, come down to Grasse. And uh, so she did. She took the train and went down there. They fell in love. And uh, she gave birth to a child, her first, my oldest half-sister, uh, about three months after he died. He had TB oh. also. Mm. But it was through his contacts with Paris that she wound up going Inter. to Paris mm -hmm. rather than returning to the north of France I and to see. her husband. I know that she, uh, I don't know how many years she spent in Paris, but we think of her as being a member of the, uh, that uh, extraordinary group of writers that was in Paris in the late 20s. And yet she, as I recall, uh, didn't like being identified with the, quote, lost generation. She did not think of it as a romantic 
generation. She felt, she talked about those people as being uh, that time, that era, that uh, uh, gathering of people as being a very depressed uh, time and uh, almost a suicidal time. She did not romanticize it the way it has been r romanticized since. Is that your recollection also? Yeah, I think, you know, Beth, I think it's true of any rich period in history. Uh, we look back now more recently on the late 60s in San Francisco and now in the 90s we think of it as this incredible renaissance of music, which it was, yeah. the birth of San Francisco rock and Jefferson Starship and Janice and Big Brother and all this kind of thing. But we also know that there was a downside to it. And I think mm -hmm. this was certainly true in Paris, that it was mm -hmm. a very desperate time. I think desperation seems to go hand in hand with artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, people were struggling. And we get this idea now that uh, people sat around in cafes on Montparnasse <laughs> and they read from their latest opuses and so you on, and that it? wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. That the people were, Kay would say that people were like terrified to write, read what they were working on, that mm -hmm. there was something that they mm -hmm. didn't do. And yet she, that was a very prolific time for her, was it not? I mean, she wrote her first books at that time. Her really prolific time, I think, came later when she was married to Lawrence Vail, the, Tell us about that. the bohemian painter um, who had been married to Peggy Guggenheim mm -hmm, and I then remember. divorced and, and married my mother. And they moved to Megève. They actually left Paris and uh, with the idea to live in the country. And they moved to Megève, which is in the French Alps, and uh, they bought a chalet and uh, named it Le Six Enfants, the six children, because Lawrence had two children from his first marriage, a son and a daughter, and Kay had four daughters, so six mm -hmm. children. And uh, I think it was, it was that period from about 1929, say, to about 1938, that Kay was extraordinarily prolific, mm -hmm. that she turned out a, a, a tremendous amount of, of, of work. But to get back to your question about or uh, about her first uh, work, which which was based on her life in in uh, with her first husband, played by the Nightingale, which was mm -hmm. based on her life with Richard and their and her Catholic family. I see. Can I just yes, interject yes. here uh, something <laughs> else that I? That what could be more wonderful? Kay was Kay had a hard time read about her because she didn't speak French. And she felt that she was being very much judged all the time by this very mm -hmm. Catholic French society. And, uh, but for, well, first I just want to mention that she, to get back to the fact that she never considered herself really an expatriate, because she said, it was in the late 20s that I went to live and work in Paris, and, and I was then still a French citizen through my marriage, these two facts would seem to disqualify me as a member of the lost generation or as an expatriate. But I was there in whatever guise, and even if a bit late, and this memoir is part of a dialogue I have never ceased having with Robert McCalman. Um, but the other thing I wanted to find, and I had it here a minute ago, um, which was here about, this sort of, for me, sums up how she felt uh, about living in those early years in, in, in this very rural yeah. setting. I feared that in a moment my sobs would tear across the soaring, awesome sanctity of this strange place. She was in a church. And that Richard's family, kneeling in one of the front pews, would turn their heads shocked, grieved, outraged, each wishing with varying intensity that I had slipped from the top deck of the De Grasse, that was the ship that they came <laughs> to Europe on, while playing shuffleboard, or having finally understood that I would leave now and burn, burn, down to the last handful of ash left in this public square. The next morning, as tough and determined as McAlman, I put my lipstick and earrings away, and I did not put them on again for a long time. And when Charlotte, that was Richard's sister, who she adored, who she was the nightingale that mm -hmm. she based her first novel on, and when Charlotte kissed my cheeks with singular emotion at breakfast on the hotel terrace that faced the square of the heretics, she whispered, blue is your color, you know. Blue, my little sister, 
My Little K. Yeah, so that was um, mm -hmm. her ally, really, mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to make the leap back now in time, but I'm so glad you read that. Uh, we have her uh, living in the French Alps with Lawrence Vale, but the the Nazi period began in Europe, and I understand that that Kay and Lawrence left Europe at, at the end of the 30s. Is that correct? They left actually in 1941, 41. so it was actually quite late. I uh -huh. mean, France had already fallen in 1939, and war had broken out in 1940, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Europe was, was certainly in turmoil. My mother was already in love with another man. <laughs> <laughs> she had a wonderful life, didn't she? <laughs> Kay, Kay loved, loved men, and that was my father, the Baron, uh -huh. who had been employed as a tutor in Mejev. And he was also a ski instructor at the time, being Austrian and being an excellent skier. But he also was someone who uh, was, uh, uh, I guess, an academician. He, had, he was well, he, he spoke several languages, uh, obviously his native tongue, German. He also spoke French and the classics, Latin and Greek. And he was hired by Kay and Lawrence to tutor the girls in oh. Mejev. And, the plot thickens. And the plot thickens. That's right. And uh, so, uh, actually, my father, she was instrumental in getting my father out of France, which was in Marseille, which was mm -hmm. the, sort of the last exit mm -hmm. out of uh, France at that time. And because of her, uh, her influence and her connections uh, with her agent back in New York, she was able to get him a visa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he went by himself uh, to America, and she and Lawrence Vale and... Peggy Guggenheim and Max Ernst who, who later was, married Peggy Guggenheim who right? later married Peggy wow and the four children what a crop <laughs> they all took off from uh, from actually they left from Mege they met, left from Marseille to Lisbon in mm -hmm. Portugal and then they took a, a what's called a clipper ship which mm -hmm. was actually a plane mm -hmm. and they flew to uh, New York in 1941 and your father and Kay were married when? In oh, not till 1942 1942. or 43, uh -huh. not the time that I was born. And you were born shortly afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I understand that that they returned to Europe in when? We returned uh, because my father, after the war, uh, was employed and retained by the Allies because of his knowledge of the uh, Nazis and their movements and their roots and their origins, particularly in Austria, he was retained as a witness at the Nuremberg trials. For oh. And he was very valuable to the Allies for that reason. What happened uh, to your father's career? Well, she was working, I understand, for the New Yorker. She was writing. a correspondent for the New Yorker magazine, yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, uh, Joseph McCarthy. And, you know, uh, he. he caused so much hell for so many people's lives, as we know. I mean, mm -hmm. that McCarthy period was a, was a very black period in American history. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the areas in which Joseph McCarthy investigated was the State Department. And he decided, uh, because of K. Boyle's political leanings and uh, because of my father being married to her and the fact that my father was such an anti-fascist, that he must be pro-communist. Must be a communist. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that my father lost his job in 1953, and that's when we returned to the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very difficult time. I understand that they spent the next nine years trying to clear his name and get him reinstated. Right, and he was finally. They were well. Actually, it was less than nine years. They were they were cleared 1956 in Washington mm. at a largely security hearing. And uh, by that time, my father was back to teaching again, which was one of his great loves. He mm -hmm. loved to teach. And we were living in Connecticut, and he was teaching at a girls' school. And I was living there, going to school there. And um, Kay was writing, or was she teaching? Kay was both. She mm -hmm. was writing, and she was teaching. And um, then it wasn't until 1961, just about, that my father was applied for a job with the State Department and was, of course, reinstated and worked uh, with the Iran-American Society in Tehran. 
Did and, you move to Tehran? And I moved to Tehran with and, Kay in 1963. Okay. And uh, but then my father got, was ill with with cancer, and and so he died uh, in, in in the fall of '63, which sort of changed everything, obviously. And and uh, and uh, so Kay had to scramble for a job, and I had. Uh, been at University of Connecticut, and so I decided to transfer out to San Francisco State, where Kay had got a job with the creative writing department. Tell us a little bit about Kay's career and her activism at San Francisco State, for which a lot of us remember her, a kind of a secondary um, uh, wallop about her life. You know, we all remember her as a writer, but we also remember her. Well, Kay was always, even when she was young, I mean, it's something that I think that her mother instilled in her. I think Kay was always very much a humanitarian and very much aware of other people and of the world. And at San Francisco State, of course, was when the Black Studies program, I mean, it was all in conjunction with so much that was happening as part of the whole incredible 60s. Civil, that was yeah, the, the Civil Rights Movement. The whole Civil Rights Movement. And it was even after that, because then you had the, the emergence of the Black Panthers, and you had the Black Studies program, which Hayakawa did not want to sanction. Yeah. And that's what really was this, what started the so-called revolution on the campus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, that's what Kay was a part of in 1968 and 1969, yeah, specifically. Professor Hayakawa, I guess he was the president of the university He became the president, time. right. Uh, he was a Mill Valleyan, too, which yes, is kind of interesting. And uh, he was certainly uh, the leader of the of the establishment point of view, and Kay was the leader, although I'm sure she didn't seek to be the leader. She was the outstanding spokesperson. She I think, was, the, she was, and I think to this day she is remembered in great part, at least in this area, mm -hmm. for, for the role that she played at San Francisco State. I know that she also became uh, an active protester of the Vietnam War. And one of my favorite uh, quotes is that uh, I know that she led a, uh, I think it was a sit-in or some such protest at the Santa Rita, no, at the Oakland Induction Center. And um, she was arrested and sent to Santa she Rita. She was arrested twice. Okay, she, well, one time yeah. when she was in Santa Rita, um, a Santa Rita prison for 30 days. She was there with Joan Baez. And one of my favorite quotes from Joan Baez is, Kay was a tough cookie, a good friend, and a great jailmate. Yes. <laughs> Which I think is quite a tribute. It was, that, it was that time and that circumstance that really cemented her friendship with the Baez family, uh -huh. which uh -huh. included Joan Sr., Joni, the folk singer, and Mimi and as Mimi. well. I know Mimi is still such a... a he has such fond memories of uh, Kay and says that, that Kay defined so much of what she grew to believe mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. what's right and just mm -hmm. and humane in this world. You mentioned how she influenced Mimi, certainly, and gave her direction. And back in the good old days, when there was a draft and when military service was compulsory, mm -hmm. um, I had gone to University of Connecticut as a freshman, and they had ROTC, which was compulsory. And I didn't think, I just couldn't see myself being in ROTC, and my mother hoped that I wouldn't be in ROTC, mm -hmm. and I had to petition the provost and so on and so forth, and eventually I was uh, dismissed, or I didn't have to take ROTC. The following spring, they made it non-compulsory. Um, and it also led me to take a stand uh, uh, about being a conscientious objector, which was very difficult back in 19, what, 1962, mm -hmm, 61. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the early, early beginnings of Vietnam were, were happening. It was mm -hmm. hardly even noticeable in this country. But uh, I became a CO after much trial and tribulation and mm -hmm. appearing before the draft board and pleading my case and petitions and so forth and so on. And, uh, and so she was very helpful in that regard too and and making me realize I wonder what it would have been like though if I had been in the army I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I always wonder about that the road not taken yeah Ian I'm I uh, think we're coming to the point where we have to wind up this interview so if you have anything else you want to say or anything else you want to read would you do it now or forever hold your peace we do want to pay tribute to your mother who was such a remarkable woman well, she, she was somebody who, and it's a quality that I admire 
she was somebody who was true to herself all yeah, the time. Absolutely. And that's a very difficult thing to do, to, 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 to live according to what you believe is right, yeah. no matter what. And I think this is something I admire in her. Um, and I'd like to end by reading a very short poem, which was really the last poem that she wrote and which I helped her write because she asked me to help her. And this was at a time when she was in the hospital and unfortunately she was in Marin General several times. Mm -hmm. And one of the times that she was in Marin General, she was watching the crows, of which there are many in Marin, uh, sitting up in the trees and cawing and cawing. She would just amuse herself by looking out the window. And she wrote this last poem called The Crow, which I get credit for oh. <laughs> in this last book, in this last book of poetry. Mm -hmm. And it's entitled The Crow. The crow sits in the pine tree and speaks of many things, among them his BA and his MA and his PhD. He rebukes the gulls for the grace of their waltzing when they come inland fleeing from storms at sea. Dressed in the outfit of an undertaker, he lectures pigeons on their promiscuity, condemns wild geese for their migratory ways, and wrapping academic gown about him, flaps off to carve his utterances further, wider, on the heretofore unsullied air. And that was written in November of 1990, just about two years before she died. <laughs>